Good morning. I am pleased to welcome you to the California Privacy Protection Agency Board's February 17th, 2022 meeting. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I'm the chairperson of the board for the agency. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, as usual, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone to please check that your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. Today's meeting will be run according to the Badly Keen Open Meeting Act, as required by law. Additionally, this meeting is being recorded. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by the board members. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, and I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Please note that each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. If you wish to speak on an item, please use the raise hand function, which is in at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will request that you unmute yourself to comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. I'd like to remain all speakers to, excuse me, I would like to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of some of the other rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may only discuss items that are on the agenda for today. Items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item designated for that purpose. If you look, it's, on, it's number six on today's agenda. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. So if for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item, and you wish to speak on that item, please use the raise your hand function and our moderator will recognize you. For those joining later in the meeting, the moderator, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, we may take a break around noon or 12.30 for lunch, um, depending on where we are on the agenda and shorter breaks as needed. Um, so if we are um, not in session when you join, um, we um, uh, just understand that we may be on a break. Uh, I thank the board members for their service and my thanks to all the people who are working to make this meeting possible. I would like to thank the team from the Office of the Attorney General supporting us today Mr. Malad Dalju, who is acting as our meeting council, Ms. Trini Hurtado, who is our moderator and is the conference services expert who's organized the infrastructure, Ms. Susan Wayland and Ms. Rachel Fraser for taking minutes, and Ms. Diancy Heinsen for ad organizing administrative staffing and resources. I would also like to thank Mr. Brian Souble, our interim general counsel, and Ms. Vaughn Chidambira, our deputy director of administration, for their work behind the scenes. I'd also like to continue to express my gratitude to the team at the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications and, um, uh, and our website and the staff at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, the Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of General Services, the Office of the Attorney General and other agencies who continue to help behind the scenes. I now call the meeting to order and would ask our moderator, Ms. Hurtado, to please conduct the roll call. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll now take roll. Uh, Ms. Lydia Delatore. Present. Mr. Vincent Lay. Present. Ms. Angela Sierra. Present. Mr. Chris Thompson. Present. And uh, Ms. Jennifer Urban. Present. Uh, all board members are present. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. The board has established a quorum. I would like to let the board members know that if we have any action items, we will be taking a roll call vote. With that, um, we will move to agenda item number two, which is an informational presentation for the board. In the board's uh, November 15th, 2021 meeting, we had some discussion and I mentioned the possibility of working with staff to collect information about organizational structure and the role of the board. I'd like to thank Executive Director Sultani for organizing this training. And I would very much like to extend our deep gratitude to the team at the Department of Consumer Affairs for putting together this material and offering it to us today. 
I will now hand things over to Ms. Kimberly Kirkmeyer, who's the Director of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, the presentation will be in two parts. Um, please hold your questions uh, until, the, um, until the speaker is done um, and the speaker will let me know that she's ready for questions and I will moderate a discussion at that time. Uh, with that, um, Ms. Kirkmeyer, um, if you're ready, um, please take it away. Good morning, my name is Lisa Bacon. I'm the Solid Training Manager at DCA and we are happy to present um, to you the board member orientation training. Uh, we have a couple things we're gonna go over uh, before Kim starts her presentation. I'd like to first share just the objectives for today's training um, and presentation. First, we're gonna talk about DCA's background, uh, some board models, roles and responsibilities, and process for regulations. This morning we have four panelists and I would like to introduce each of them. First, Kim Kirk Kirkmeyer is the director at DCA. We also have our chief deputy director, Christine Lawley. Uh, we have CPA uh, California Board of Accountancy, Nancy Corrigan also presenting for us. And Christy Schlege is an attorney for um, here at DCA. And without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Kim to begin the presentation. Good morning, everyone. And thank you again so much for having uh, me here today. I wanted just to provide a quick back, little bit about my background. Um, I have about 30 years in state service and I've been privileged to be at the Department of Consumer Affairs during this entire time. I've served two boards within the Department of Consumer Affairs and I've had the honor of having two governor appointments within the Department of Consumer Affairs headquarters office. I've also had the honor for most of those years working directly with board members, either at a board or at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Therefore, I know how important that relationship between the board executive director and staff and board members is. We are all a team, and as with most teams, communication is key, and understanding of each other's roles and responsibilities is very important. I wanted to start out with just a little bit about the Department of Consumer Affairs. DCA is an extremely unique um, as a state agency. We have approximately 3,300 employees and a budget of about $704 million which we use to license and regulate 3.4 million licensees. Within the Department of Consumer Affairs, there are 37 individual entities of which 28 are semi-autonomous boards with approximately 350 board members. The oldest board within the Department of Consumer Affairs is the Medical Board of California, which actually was started in 1876 to license and regulate physicians. So, the, the whole premise of DCA has been around for quite some time. Those 28 different entities have board members as the CPPA who make industry policy decisions for the individual board and they're appointed by the governor, the speaker and the Senate. Now I'd like to pass it off to our chief deputy director um, Christine Lally to provide a little bit of information about those boards and some other similar boards. Thank you, Director. Um, good morning, everybody. As you know, CPPA is governed by a five-member board. For comparison, let's take a look at sam a sampling of other state boards. Within the Department of Consumer Affairs, for example, we have the Medical Board of California, which the director was the executive director of. Um, that board has 15 board members, almost 200 employees, and oversees a budget of $76 million. Also, the California Board of Accountancy, another 15 member, a large board within the Department of Consumer Affairs with over 100 employees and a budget of $18 million. Another large board within DCA, Contractor State License Board, 15 board members with over 400 employees and a budget of $77 million. Other examples outside of DCA include California Transportation Commission. They have 13 commission members 
also appointed by the governor and some members appointed by the legislature. These commissioners are not full-time employees. They receive $100 per diem, much like you, and they oversee a budget of $12 million. Another example, the Travel and Tourism Commission. They actually have 37 members, I can't even imagine, <laughs> appointed by the governor and also by other commissioners. They actually do not receive any per diem and they only get reimbursed for their travel expenses. Another commission I'm sure that you are uh, very familiar with, the Public Utilities Commission. They have five members appointed by the governor and those members have to be confirmed by the Senate, which is a process called um, much like it is, Senate confirmation. And they serve for six year terms and these commissioners are full-time commissioners and they're actually considered salaried and appointees. So they work 100% of their time for the commission and they oversee a budget of $1.8 billion. And finally, um, an example that I'm sure many of you on, um, uh, many of you are licensees of when I looked at your bios, <laughs> you're very familiar with the state bar uh, board of Trustees, and that's a 13-member board uh, with members appointed by the governor, legislature, and superior court. Um, they, unlike the Public Utilities Commission, they are not full-time employees. Um, they are just appointed board members, and they oversee a budget of $140 million. So as you can see, there's a variety of different structures within state government, um, but primarily through uh, or the department that we oversee and the boards and bureaus and commissions that the department uh, provides oversight for. It's primarily the model of appointed board members um, who, per, who are, receive per diem, $100 per diem for their service. They're not full-time employees. So moving on, I wanted to give a little bit about our board member duties here and an overview of that. Um, the board members are appointed to perform the following duties. I'm just going to go over this slide real quickly. Um, the first one is that they hire an executive director. Um, they also set policy. And it's important to point out here that they set policy for the profession, not for the staff and the day-to-day -day operations or how the office should be run. That really is the role of the executive director. They also adopt regulations and they inform the strategic planning. And really our board missions here within the Department of Consumer Affairs is rulemaking, enforcement, licensing, they do outreach, and most importantly, they have consumer protection as their main mission. I wanted to provide, this is something we use for, we do a board member orientation training for our board members, each um, board member when they get appointed. We do this um, three times a year and these individuals come together and we provide training. And we use this Venn diagram. This Venn diagram actually explains the roles of both the executive director and the board members. But it also explains how important it is for the executive director and the board members to have a cooperative relationship where you work together to meet that mission of the board. It kind of goes hand in hand, and you can see that really a lot from this Venn diagram. The executive director and the board should be in communication both at board meetings, but also in between board meetings. The executive director should be keeping the board members aware of issues as they arise, and they uh, also should be providing updates regarding the board and its projects. The executive director also really remains very in close communication with the board chair um, to ensure that those projects are getting done and to discuss the agenda and the board meeting format or schedule. It's kind of like you work as a, a member, a team of two. But now I'd like to discuss each of these roles a little bit more. And I will now hand it off to board member Corrigan, who's really going to talk about from her perspective as a member. Um, and the role of the board members. So, Ms. Corrigan. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, uh, board members, for having us here today. So, I'm Nancy Corrigan. I'm a certified public accountant. I'm licensed by the California Board of Accountancy, and I've been in public practice, really in the environment of a CPA firm, for over 35 years. For a good part of that time, I also was a co-owner of the firm. 
So on the California Board of Accountancy, I have been involved for a period of nearly 20 years. The last few years uh, as a board member, most recently I'm its uh, immediate past president for the last two years, just prior to that their secretary treasurer. But before that, for 15 years, I served on all of its advisory committees. And that involves, such as you know, Kim mentioned a moment ago, licensing, enforcement, and peer review oversight. Our board currently oversights some 114,000 licensees. So that's the most in the nation. And it also speaks as to why we have a staff of 100 plus. So just to clarify, I'm not here as a representative of the board, but rather to offer my knowledge and experience as a board member of the California Board of Accountancy. So continuing on with the role of board members and setting policy by adopting regulations, Board members direct the board's work by letting the executive director know what the priorities of the board are. Note, as Kim mentioned, we don't handle the day-to-day, -day, the incoming, the outgoing, the licensee applications, you know, uh, processing claims that are made by the public or other licensees. Those are the details handled by the executive director and the staff that, that he or she supervises. The board handles special projects and issues that arise where, or where we may wanna set a new industry standard. For example, with the California Board of Accountancy, we recently worked hard and had legislation passed that allowed CPA candidates to take the exam earlier. They had to be on the right path, the right track of education, but that kind of releases the CPA pipeline. There's a shortage of CPAs. So things like that are what the board deals with, things of that nature. So our mission is consumer protection, as is yours. And so the decisions that we make for our sector or our profession in this case all have to do with consumer protection. Policymaking occurs at board meetings and discussions regarding these specific issues. Do we volley them back and forth? frequently and involve our staff, DCA legal affairs and others? Yes, numerous, numerous times. Do we always agree? No, we do not. But as a board, we take a vote. The majority is what then is carried forward and acting as a cohesive group and conducting ourselves in that way is what makes us most uh, successful in satisfying and meeting the needs of the consumers as a whole. Issues are topics that come before us are brought to us by the staff, possibly a board member notices an issue that needs to be dealt with, a consumer. They get to us and they are discussed and uh, that is the way that we do it. But all decisions are made by the board and no action is taken until the board is comfortable and happy move and moves on. So these meetings are all public, You know, they're open meetings, they're recorded and they are archived for future reference. Uh, thank you, and back to you, Kim. Thank you. I'd like to talk now about the role of the executive director. Since Ms. Corrigan spoke about how they're setting policy, the executive director's main role is to implement the policy that the board then has put together, and then ensure that all laws and regulations are being followed. It's important for the executive director really to know what is important to the board because that's the driving force behind their actions. And then the executive director also, as we've spoken um, a couple of times, also directs and manages the day-to-day -day operations of staff and the board. And I'd like to pass it up to Christine to handle the rest of that portion. And additionally, um, on the role of the executive director, he files the disciplinary actions against licensees in his or her official capacity as the executive director of the board. Um, the executive director is the sole individual who signs the charging documents and is the one who is seeking action against specific licensees. For example, if you've ever had the opportunity to look up a license on the Department of Consumer Affairs website, um, and you go into the disciplinary actions um, that are posted publicly for the DCA board, you will see that the executive director's name is actually listed as the complainant on the accusation against the licensee, as well as the executive direct director's signature. So he or she signs every uh, final page of the accusation, which is the charging document against the licensee. 
and I will pass it back over to Ms. Corrigan. Thank you. So in reference to that, the board members meet and vote on actions taken against licensees. These could come from referrals of criminal or civil matters, complaints filed against licensees by the public. They could be administrative. You know, I forget to renew my license on time. I do not respond timely to a notice, that sort of thing. So there are administrative matters that have to be dealt with. As a board, we serve as the judge and we vote on resolution of enforcement actions. A few examples for our board could be, we can revoke licenses, we can suspend them for a period of time for performing all services, we can suspend them for selected services, maybe they can perform tax but not audit and review. We can place them on probation so they are oversighted for a period of time. And we can even reinstate previously revoked licenses. You know, I put in my time away now, I am applying for reinstatement and the board would do that sort of thing. So this all happens in closed session, which is not recorded or archived for future reference. Well, thank you, Kim, back to you. Another role of the executive director really is representing that board in different settings. These settings include the legislature, here, the executive director would provide the board's decision, not staff's decision. These discussions should take place after a decision has been made at a board meeting. They also represent um, the board in front of media. The executive director is usually the face of the board doing interviews um, and, if necessary, providing information to the media. And then finally, in front of the public, the executive director is the representation usually that goes out and provides presentations. So it is important for the public to see board members too. Although this is the executive director's role, the executive director can also call on board members to assist in this presentation. So for example, presentations with stakeholders may help if there's a board member there to do part of that presentation and provide education on the um, functions of the board. Ms. Corrigan, can you please provide your input on this representation? Certainly. I know that when I am dealing with legislature, media, the public, that I am there certainly representing my board as a whole. And so I'm not there representing myself. I have to be careful not to take calls from the press and refer them to our executive director or public information officers to, so that it can be handled appropriately. And I don't place my board, I don't jeopardize them in any way. I cannot provide advice or decisions that are not discussed and voted on by the board. So I just can't kind of go out on my own and do what I wanna do if I do. And it isn't in line with the board's decisions and regulations. This can be considered an underground regulation not being the voice of the board as a whole. And you can just imagine the many compound legal issues that might arise from something like this. For example, for our licensees or consumers. So it's very, very dangerous to do that. Thank you, Kim. Back to Christine. Um, <clears throat> the, additionally, the role of the executive director is managing staff and overseeing operations. and. You know, since the executive director is hired by the board, that executive director is the principal operations officer for the board. They're re specifically responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the board's resources and staff. The board members hire the executive director to provide the daily leadership to staff. And then with this full-time salaried executive director in place, the board members are free to then do their job providing oversight and insight on policy making. I liken the executive director and uh, board, relate, board member relationship to much like a driver. So if you hired a driver, that driver is responsible for making sure the car's gassed up, all of the maintenance is done and it's ready to go. And you get in that car and you give the directions on where you wanna go. And that executive director is driving the car or flying the plane to where the board members want it to go. Um, among the greatest responsibilities for executive directors is managing the administrative and fiscal functions of the board. For example, um, an executive director is responsible for managing the board's budget. So you're making sure that the money is being spent appropriately 
and efficiently and that the board remains uh, uh, maintains a healthy fund condition and when additional funding is needed to hire more staff or you need additional resources the executive director works very closely with the board chair on funding priorities and identifying them and then drafting budget change proposals for consideration and then eventual hopefully and eventually included in the governor's uh, proposed budget every year. The executive director is also responsible for managing all board, uh, board personnel. And this includes rec recruiting staff, retaining them, training staff, and staff development. It's really, I can't stress this enough, just based on um, my experience here at the Department of Consumer Affairs, how important it is for board members um, not to get involved in the day-to-day -day management of personnel. You know, this is truly the executive director's role and why he or she was hired. And um, with the state civil service reporting structure, this can truly be problematic if board members do get involved in the day-to-day, -day, especially um, with the reporting structure between an executive director and his or her staff. And Ms. Corrigan, the, the role of the um, oversight of the executive director. Yes, thank you. So as was mentioned, and you kind of get the gist of it, the board must ensure that the executive director is performing as designated by the board. It's leading the board properly and making good decisions for the board. So it was mentioned earlier that yes, there's ongoing communication primarily with the chair, but you are all seeing the executive director in your regular meetings, correspondence, other communications that are generated by that position. So you're really able to evaluate and see that performance all year long basically, but to really accomplish this oversight, you can hire, you can terminate obviously, and you perform annual evaluations. And the annual evaluations ensure and document that the executive director knows the board's expectations are properly leading and making good decisions for the board and also to address deficiencies that may be occurring. Not to forget that it's also a time during that annual evaluation to commend them on a job well done. Thank you. And just in closing, um, you know, stressing the importance of collaboration, as all of you have probably been experiencing for months, standing up this um, new agency, and the importance of communication. The director had said it in, the, in her beginning um, mark, remarks that communication truly is key. Um, we've all been uh, appointed, you know, you from your different appointing authorities. Um, and you have uh, appointed an executive director, just as our boards and bureaus do as well. And uh, communication is truly what gets us through the day to day, but ultimately gets us to our um, achieving our goals and uh, gets us through our strategic planning and gets us through the hard times. Um, another item that I just like to uh, stress is in communicating and working together and collaborating um, that we take the time to put principles over personality so that we are all working together and um, you know, working as a board, working as a team, because ultimately um, that gets us to achieving our goals. Um, and with that, I think we'll open it up for questions. Great, thank you, Ms. Laley and Ms. Kirkmeyer um, and Ms. Corrigan um, for that very helpful presentation. Are there any questions or comments from the board? If you use the raise hand function, I will recognize you. All right. Um, Ms. Kirkmeyer, I believe you and your team will be here through the other part of the presentation as well, correct? So if something occurs, um, we will have discussion um, after that as well. 
Uh, and given that the board doesn't have um, questions at the moment, um, I will hand it um, over to Ms. Shields for the second part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Christy Shield. I'm an attorney with the California Department of Consumer Affairs. I've been with the department for 22 years. Prior to joining the department, I worked in the private sector as a corporate counsel and litigator on behalf of the regulated community. So I have experience in regulations from both sides, both perspectives and uh, currently work in the regulatory review unit where I review regulations for all our departmental constituent agencies within the department. So today we're going to be discussing the process of adopting regulations through a regular rulemaking. And the regular rulemaking process is one type of regulatory action. There are others, emergency, technical cleanup rulemakings known as section 100 changes. But today we're gonna to focus on regular rulemaking, which is the most common form of rulemaking under the California Administrative Procedure Act and your role in that process. So this is very dense material. So if you have questions, please feel free to, to ask those as we move through the presentation. Next slide, please. So to begin our discussion, I'm providing you a like very simplified overview of the regulatory process. This is a standard regular rulemaking process background. We won't spend too much time on this slide as we'll be going into more detail regarding various phases that are highlighted here on the screen in the presentation. Areas that are highlighted in red show board member direct involvement. So the regulatory phases for a regular rulemaking, there are four of them. Generally, we consider these four phases as, and I don't know where the rest of the slide is, um, concept, thank you. <laughs> concept is the first phase where the problem is defined and proposed text is developed by the board. Production, where all regulatory text and supporting documentation, including the initial statement of reasons, is prepared for filing with the Office of Administrative Law. That is the agency that is responsible for reviewing and approving all regulations for state agencies in the state of California. The third phase is initial where the formal adoption process begins by filing the proposed text with the Office of Administrative Law and the accompanying rulemaking documentation for publication and 45 day public comment period and possibly one or more hearings to receive public comments occurs. The fourth stage is the final stage where the board responds to comments received during the comment period, decides whether to modify text, and then acts at a board meeting to approve final text. Once text is approved, staff will finalize the supporting documentation, including the final statement of reasons and submits the final rulemaking file to OAL for final review. So concept phase is the first phase. And I would say this pre-filing stage is where the heavy lifting occurs from a regulatory perspective. And I feel like it's the most important part of rulemaking. Generally, we found that if the board addresses all of these objectives prior to filing a proposed regulation, it will help ensure a successful outcome. So the more work you put in at this stage, the easier the process becomes to successfully adopt a regulation. The first concept is to define the problem. And that may take you know, several meetings and, and some underlying work, but that is a real key component, defining the problem, describing the objectives you hope to achieve, brainstorming possible solutions, consulting with those who would be affected by the proposal. And this, mind you, is required by law for complex or large proposals that are not capable of being reviewed 
easily during the 45 day public comment period and for major regulations. And we'll discuss what a major regulation is a little bit later. Then you'll want to list and evaluate the costs and benefits because this is part of the regulatory control agency, the Department of Finances will, will look at your costs associated with the regulatory proposal and you have a lot that you have to do to make sure that those requirements for the Department of Finance are met. So it's important to list and evaluate the costs and benefits upfront so you're prepared to address the questions that may come from that agency. The sixth one is um, choose an option. So, you know, this concept phase, you'll choose your solution and you have to be prepared to explain why it is the preferred solution above others that may be proffered during the process. Next slide. So board member role in concept development, I've listed here. So in this section, I'll walk you through the general process for developing regulatory concepts and provide you with some examples of how boards in our department have approached regulation development. Box one, uh, involves the concept and where it comes from. An idea for regulation may originate from statute, board staff, your regulated public, industry groups, people who may interact with your regulated public, and from you based on your experience and knowledge. Box two, to start the process, the board's chair in consultation with the board's executive director places a regulatory concept on the board's agenda for discussion and possible action. Typically, the board staff will develop concepts for regulatory proposals and bring these items to a board meeting and present them to you for discussion. However, if the proposal involves complicated or technical subject matter, you're gonna to wanna to have the board explore a variety of methods to develop the regulatory language. And so in the discussion process, you may assign, if you look at box four, the concept to a stakeholder meeting, seek a contract with a subject matter expert to help explore and develop concepts or assign it to a board committee. And uh, I wanna make a special note that um, one, one avenue that some of the boards have used is to assign a concept development for tax to a two person uh, advisory committee. Um, those are more flexible since under the Open Meeting Act, advisory committees do not need to be noticed. And so there may be some advantage at some point where you need to do some real um, heavy work with uh, development of the regulation where a two-person committee may be, may be of, of interest and may be useful to you in developing the regulation. So back to board member discussion. Um, so once your committee, um, if it's assigned to a committee, it may send it back. So the arrow really should go backwards and forwards between board member discussion and committee because it can go back and forth several times between discussion points at board meetings and committee meetings or other types of meetings where information is collected. And the board member discussion in the role of a board member, your role would, would include suggestions as to concepts that should be in the regulations that are being developed, like wouldn't it be best if we required a privacy notice to the consumer informing them of the uses of personal information? These ideas may just be discussed at the board meeting or a, a board member committee meeting if a committee exists, if you have standing committees or committees that are created by action of the board. Um, you may also provide suggested changes to the text at the board meeting or at any other noticed meeting, including committee meetings, if you're a committee member. The board may also decide whether to conduct formal stakeholder meetings. Uh, they are generally informal uh, working groups, but if you decide to have formal stakeholder meetings um, with board members attending, you're going to want to notice those meetings in compliance with the Open Meeting Act if a majority of the board members participate in these informal meetings. Research and outreach um, may take some time. So if you look at the fourth box, that fourth box is there's a lot going on between the third and fourth box in the development in terms of board member uh, roles and participation. And um, it may take some time to, to develop that if you particularly need to consult with other agencies like the attorney general's office or another agency or association who may have 
a substantial interest in the regulations or other issues that may be uh, need further analysis, for, for instance, by a subject matter uh, expert like preliminary cost analysis where your budget office or a subject matter sometimes if you subject matter expert sometimes if you assign that um, particular economic study to a, a subject matter expert, um, you may need to consult with them if the cost or benefit is in excess of 10 million. In which case we recommend uh, you consult with the Department of Finance to ensure that the board makes economic impact assessments in the manner required by the Department of Finance regulations. Stakeholder meetings are generally informal, but um, and be held, are held by staff, as I mentioned, um, but can include board members if they want to participate. Um, as a requirement for major regulations, you have to hold these stakeholder meetings. We generally like, recommend them uh, if they're complicated at the beginning and also at, as text is finalized. Um, and a major regulation is one that will have an economic impact on California business enterprises and individuals in an amount exceeding 50 million as estimated by the agency. But we also recommend you hold stakeholder meetings to receive input on text, even if it's not large, complex, or major. If there's a high amount of public interest in the subject matter, because uh, it helps reduce the chances of adverse comments during the formal rulemaking process. And you know, if you don't, if you don't try to do that and you know it's a controversial subject matter, it could add further delay to your rulemaking process. As an example, I had a client with a relatively short regulation. It was like five sections. And however, the industry had sponsored the legislation that enabled them to adopt the regulation. And it was a regulation that affected the ability of the industry to pay itself from a trust that they ran. So it was a financial interest, high financial interest by the industry. And the agency drafted regulations without consultation with the affected community, filed them and got 44 adverse comments. And so at that point, the agency withdrew the filing and revised it significantly, held stakeholder meetings. It was positively received. Changes were made in consultation with the affected stakeholders. It was later filed. We got no adverse comments and it was adopted. So as a small example, you can see how you can avoid problems if you engage stakeholders early on in the development and the finalization of your tax before you file it. Failing to do that can add significant delay to the process. Um, and you know, as, as a matter of, of the record that you need to build, the Administrative Procedure Act requires you to include as part of the formal rulemaking package, uh, all these steps you see on the screen. All the, the record of the development of the regulation is done in public as we've discussed. These are required to be held publicly, these meetings. Um, you're going to document everything that's going on at these meetings, and it's important to have all the factual information in the record that you relied on in adopting the regulations. The Administrative Procedure Act requires it. So to help meet that standard, we always recommend that stakeholder meetings be authorized by the board to help establish a clear and legally defensible record for your rulemaking. If board members engage with stakeholders outside of a public noticed meeting and not pursuant to any official delegation, we suggest that you make it clear that the position is personal and not a position of the board. Further, we recommend board members take steps to avoid serial meetings in the development of regulations where board member proposals are discussed outside of a noticed meeting by a majority of members directly or indirectly through intermediaries or the use of technological devices to develop concurrence as to action to be taken on the regulation. Zero meters are considered violations and therefore if the board members will be participating in informal meetings, even separately in different informal working groups, then it is best practice to treat those meetings as subject to the Open Meeting Act because it is highly likely that a serial meeting could occur and comments from one board member at one meeting shared 
at a subsequent meeting with another board member. So it's always important to be aware of who's participating and whether you have a majority of members when developing regulations. So as we move through the process, again, you're gonna be reviewing and acting on text that comes back from your committees or board member discussion at board meetings and the final step in concept development is approval of the text for filing. Next slide, please. So here's a sample of how regulatory proposals may be developed in your packet. Here we have a committee of the board that has been tasked by the board to work on the development of text at a publicly noticed committee meeting and then report back to the board by way of meeting minutes. So all of those meetings and agendas posted, available to the public, part of the record in the development of regulations, compounding is very complicated. And so these committees were essential in to developing the text for that board. Um, the board may also choose to delegate tasks to staff to set up stakeholder meetings on con or contract with subject matter experts, as I've previously discussed. All of these options should be set forth in meeting materials, typically in memos and attachments in the board meeting packets. So um, Ms. Bacon, I don't know if you can go to our reference materials, but I want to give you some real concrete examples of how regs are developed um, in the process. So this is um, item number one, and if you could scroll down, you can see I've highlighted it for you right here. Um, this is a board meeting where they have noticed a concept uh, for a regulation, and you see that the board has been given presentations regarding automated drug delivery systems. This is for when you want to refill your prescription. They were considering allowing automation as opposed to getting it directly from the pharmacy and the pharmacist. So there was a discussion regarding the features, the discussion regarding circumstances under which this system could be used, the impact on public safety, and then discussion regarding the next steps, like how are they going to proceed to develop the regulations? Are they gonna to assign to committee? What are they going to do from this point forward? So this would be an example of how you could start the process of discussing a concept at a public board meeting, because that has to come from you as the board, you have to direct the traffic on how you would like to see a, a complicated issue like this addressed. The sex, second bookmark is um, bookmark number two. Um, you'll see is a two person committee. And as I mentioned, you don't have to notice these, but here the board did this because they wanted to invite public discussion on this item. And if you would scroll down a little bit, please. So you'll see these just very general concepts, discussions where they wanted to get feedback from the stakeholders on, on areas they think they're probably gonna need to regulate in. And then there was a compounding general proposal discussion Nothing real firm, but just getting ideas from the, the regulated community. Tab three, please. And so here's a compounding committee. So you'll see there's more members on this one. This one has to be noticed because it's more than three. Um, sorry, bookmark three, yeah. Um, and so, these are sample materials from that committee meeting. You would get a copy of everything that happened at this meeting at a subsequent board meeting. You would get the committee report here, um, if you could scroll down a little bit. Um, so you can see how they are discussing consideration of amendments. And, and then there's the background and the information. So this report and the all the attachments, including and the attachments have the, the copies of the proposed text, and um, if you could scroll down a little bit, um, you can see proposed regulation language is here, and, the, and, it, and then attachment two has further memos regarding um, the necessity aspect of the regulation. Um, can we go to tab number four, please? This is a sample work group. Again, um, this is where we're inviting public participation and interaction on concepts. So if we could just scroll down a little bit there. So you can see um, here what happened at this committee meeting was there, were a, there was a presentation, there was discussion on draft revisions to guidelines and there's background. So all of this material would come to you 
at, at every board meeting, typically, you would see how your committee's handling the issue. You'd be able to discuss what the committee's looking at um, and what's happening with the development of the regulation. And you'd see how the public uh, was involved in the process. And so we usually have a standing item on regulations for every board meeting. Uh, no, item number uh, five, if you could see that. Okay, so here's a compounding committee meeting minute. Um, I wanted to scroll down real quickly. If you could go to, um, let's see here. You can see how the deliberation occurs here. Um, if we could go to one of the headings. Okay, so stop, please. Okay, so you'll see how the heading is the regulation topic, um, how the committee went section by section, inviting public comment and board member discussion. So you'll see back and forth, like Mr. Lippi, I know is a board member, um, and they talked edits. This is, so the committees tend to do a lot of the heavy lifting of development so that when it comes to the board, it's in a pretty good position for board member deliberation and review. But you can see how, the board members have run this meeting and deliberated on each section that has been developed through the stakeholder workshops and other committee work that has been done. Okay, um, number six, please. Number six is a sample agenda. If we could go down, sorry, but it's like three pages. It's item H7, sorry about that. Okay, okay, stop. So here you'll see the item where they're actually saying they need more outside consultant or expert study to develop the regulation. And so this is the action item where, you know, the board's deciding, do we need an expert or not? The staff thinks so, but, and they're, and they're laying out their arguments to the board for why they would need an expert. And then this is the, the agenda item discussion regarding the contracting process and the possible timeline for possible rulemaking once the, the study has completed. So this is an example of a subject matter expert referral for a regulation development. And then item seven. Okay, so here's an example of um, a public sta stakeholder workshop that was held via WebEx. Again, if you could scroll down a bit, um, there's a, just a brief summary of what's proposed to be discussed. And then we don't have here, but um, it also attached the text to the meeting notice so that the, the regulated community could see what um, they would be going through. And then after, and this was recorded and the minutes were transcribed so that um, the control agencies could see uh, all the comments that were received and discussed at the stakeholder meeting and that this item was vetted before it actually got filed with the Office of Administrative Law. So if we can go back to the, the PowerPoint. Okay, next slide, please. So once the, is there, once there was a um, uh, board reviews and approves the text, the, the final draft concept is ready. It comes to you at a board meeting and it's generally provided in a document entitled proposed language to the members and the text is shown in underlined for additions and strike out for deletion. So it's clear what proposed changes the board would be making. The document is provided along with a cover memo to the board members explaining the problem, describing how the staff proposal would address the problem and suggesting possible actions or motions the board members may make to act on the proposal. Um, so possible motions, number two, if you could bring that up. Um, possible motions usually include a motion to approve the text as provided in the meeting materials, approve the text with modifications. If you have issues with how the text is drafted, you can still adopt the proposal, but you actually would have to, um, you know, say in your motion what you would like to change in the regulatory text. Or if you feel like it's really not completely developed, maybe it's a little um, needs more work from your perspective, you can refer it back to a committee or the executive director to address concerns you've raised at the meeting. 
and bring it back to the board for further deliberation. But if you approve the text, this is the type of motion we typically recommend you give um, to approve the, the proposal. And that would include delegations to the executive director that would set the matter for a public hearing if you want one, set a hearing only if requested by the public, delegating the executive officer the authority to make non-substantive like correct typographical errors in the proposal, adopt the regulations as approved by the board and complete the rulemaking process on the board's behalf if no adverse comments are received. This delegation enables your executive officer to handle the administrative details of adopting the regulation without the board needing to have a meeting to conclude each step required to finalize the board's action. You may also conduct public hearings regarding the regulatory text during your notice board meetings, or you can delegate to the staff to hold those hearings separate from the board meeting, in which case there would be a court reporter present typically or other um, uh, meeting minutes recorded so that you would get a copy of everything that happened at the hearing before you act on deciding whether to uh, make any further changes to the text after comments are received. Next slide, please. So, Christy, I wanted to let you know we have about a five minute time check. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, just for to be quickly to go through this, the staff production phase. Uh, if you just want to, can you put all the items up, please, for, for them? So, the delegation enables your staff to do all of these things. And this is what we consider ministerial parts of the production phase because the policy making aspect is the concept in the text. They are not allowed to move text forward uh, and make any changes without your approval. So the text has to be approved and the only part that's delegated is to make uh, non-substantive, maybe there was a typo like a spelling error in the text or a comma that was missing, but it can't be an Oxford comma. It has to be just something that was is an obvious technical mistake that can be cleaned up and um, that would be the only authority you're giving. Everything else we consider ministerial because the package uh, portions include all these kind of administrative documents that have to be filed with the Office of Administrative Law and the Department of Finance. And so each one of these items has to be prepared as part of the package and submitted. And that's usually what you delegate to your executive director to do to produce the package uh, for filing. Next slide, please. So through the delegation voted on the board, staff's authorized to initiate the rulemaking package with the Office of Administrative Law and the notice has to be published in the register at least 45 days prior to the hearing and close of public comment period. And OEL is responsible for the publication once it's accepted it for filing. They have to notify you of any deficiencies within three business days after filing and the register is published on Fridays with a final filing date of 10 calendar days preceding the date. So you have to add two weeks to your 45 day comment period to make sure that you meet all the publication deadlines. So all of these technical things are handled by staff. And that's why we recommend the delegation because otherwise you have to bring all of this back over and over again to the board. Um, delegating it to a single individual uh, avoids any Open Meeting Act issues for you. Um, once it's approved, the staff will mail notice of the proposed action to interested parties and representative business and post all the documents on your website for 45 days prior to the close uh, of the common period or a hearing if you schedule one. Next slide, please. Um, initial phase um, board oversight. So once the comment period opens and you start receiving comments, um, the, the matter will be brought back to you and placed on an agenda again. Um, you must consider all comments on a regulation, be they in favor or against, whether they're anonymous from a large association or a lo lobby group. Staff typically prepares proposed responses to comments and requests your decision to accept or modify text. Of course, you don't have to accept those recommendations. You can make your own. Uh, but if the board votes to accept the comments and modify the text, a notice of modified text will be issued um, to the regulated public or the affected stakeholders, posted on your website, and it's get 15 days or 45 days. Um, but you will be the, the final decision maker on that modified text. 
after they've completed um, the review of the any further comments to the modified text will again be brought back to you at a board meeting if there are any. Um, and all of this information will be brought back to you in a memo outlining all the information that I just mentioned. Um, can we go to the bookmark again, the, the regulata regulated reference materials, sorry, regulatory reference materials. Um, item eight, can you go to page 91, please, of item eight? Ninety-one, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Um, discussion and possible action. You know, there's there's an item here that's discussing um, how uh, what the steps are to move this process along. Can you scroll down a little bit, please? Keep going. So, and then you know, um, these are the motions that I discussed previously that you can make. If you don't want to make any changes after the public comment period closes and the hearing closes, these are the, the, the motions you would make. If you do want to make changes, again, I do recommend you state them specifically and clearly in the record in addition to this motion. Um, and then you direct staff to take the steps necessary to complete the process. And if you don't get adverse comments, the staff will just file it and adopt it on your behalf. I mean, executive officer or director. In this case, it was the executive officer, but it's the same uh, position for you as the executive director. So can we go back to the PowerPoint, please? Okay, next slide, please. So again, the board meetings are held and the process of revising the text continues until there are no further adverse comments or the board says we're good with this version of the text and they reject any of the adverse comments that come through. Next, uh, there have been times though that um, it can take four to five years for a, a package to complete uh, if we get a lot of adverse comments, or as I've mentioned, you don't do that initial legwork of prepping your stakeholders and vetting out all the issues that, that may come up during your rulemaking process before you file it. So that is something to keep in mind going forward. Um, next slide, please. So in the final phase, you uh, will get the proposed text like that memo set forth there. Um, you'll approve the text, you'll delegate to the executive director the authority to complete the rulemaking file, including the preparation of the final statement of reasons, make any non-substantive or technical changes and take all steps to, to complete the rulemaking. Um, then the staff will file the final package with the Office of Administrative Law per the board's motion. The staff are the contact persons on all rulemaking packages, so those um, the staff will be handling communications to avoid Open Meeting Act issues. That is why it's delegated to your executive director, so that that the communications with OAL occur through your um, your agent, your executive director, and um, any issues with. Uh, the package that OAL, the Department of Finance, which are the control agencies that approve regulations, um, will be brought back to you uh, for discussion at a future board meeting if they're unable to resolve or address the issues that are raised. So how do you prepare for a board member action on regulations? We recommend you review the memos, the text, and the supporting documentation. List questions, if possible, seek clarification prior to the meeting. Um, read the staff memo and associated documents and come prepared to your meeting to ask questions and cast a vote. Uh, you should review the memos and they're important because they provide options and reasons for the proposal. Additionally, the supplemental materials may show you why the proposed text is necessary, what the new regulations might look like, and what is being changed. This will give you a high level overview of the matter. While reading the materials, list any questions you might have so you can come to the meeting prepared and ask staff for clarity or even approach staff prior to a meeting. As a board member, you may ask questions such as uh, possible alternatives that you might want them to consider, or you may look at or ask staff for, or a committee of the board to research how other states or other programs handle similar issues. 
Consider your vote at the meeting and how you think you will vote on the matter. Um, consider whether legal standards are met and, and alternatives considered. Next slide, please. So when reviewing text, um, in our experience, these things will help you um, guide the discussion at board meetings. Um, you should look and see uh, whether there are any unintended consequences that may occur to you in reviewing the information and raise those issues at the meeting or with the executive director prior to the meeting. Um, is this the least restrictive alternative or interpretation that your agency can choose to implement the law? That is something that uh, you need to cover in the rulemaking documents. You have to state whether they're all least, this is the least restrictive alternative or whether you, uh, why you chose to implement it if it is restrictive. Uh, next slide, please. So these items are the six standards that the Office of Administrative Law uses to evaluate your regulations and whether they're in compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act. So these are appropriate questions for you to ask of staff and um, bring up at board meetings. And is it necessary? Do you have the authority to adopt regulations on the subject matter? Does the proposal make specific or interpret a law under your jurisdiction? Is it clear? Is it in harmony with or does it conflict with California or federal statutes or other regulations? Or does it duplicate something already required in state or federal law or regulation? If you don't meet these standards, it's grounds for disapproval of the regulation. So it is appropriate for you to bring these issues up when reviewing regulations. Next slide, please. That's all I have. I'm sorry I rushed it through there, but wanted to try to make, make our time frame. So any questions that the board members have? Thank you very much, Ms. Shields. Um, uh, if board members could raise their hands if you have questions or comments uh, for Ms. Shields or if you've, something has occurred to you from the prior presentation, um, because I believe all those folks are still here, uh, please do that and I will recognize you. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the thorough presentation. Um, there was a point, I apologize, I don't recall which slide it was, um, where the, the practices to consult with those affected by the proposed regulation, um, which it seems like there'd be you know, multiple categories of entities affected. Um, the regulated, but then also the consumers who are the beneficiary of the protection. Is, is there a best practice that you all have recommended for getting input from consumers who are the beneficiary of the pr protection, who are obviously kind of diffused and not typically organized? Well, of course, if we know of consumer organizations that have reached out to us, we will send the notice out to them specifically. It's always posted. Uh, stakeholder meetings are always posted on our websites, whether they're informal or formal, because we want to get as much input from every source as possible. But um, if you're aware of associations, certainly let your executive director know or bring it up at a board meeting. It would be a good idea if we reached out to this organization and provided them a copy of the notice. But um, when I say stakeholder, I'm talking about everybody, everybody, consumers, industry, um, legislature. I mean, sometimes it's a good idea to invite the legislature uh, sponsor uh, of the bill to your meeting so they can see that you're actively working on the legislation that they're that they proposed and that you're being responsive, partic particularly if there's a um, mandate in the law that you do something by a specific date regulatory wise. So it's always a good idea to just do as many, um, you know, e mail, email blasts as you can to invite participation, but always put it on your website and make it in a prominent location so that you get as much input as possible from all sources. Because it, like I said, it's really important to try to make sure you've, you've brought this issue forward before you file, if you know it's gonna be controversial or even if you're not sure and you're just concerned about making sure you get as much input as possible, um, doing that upfront will save you a lot of heartache when it comes to, to filing a regulation because once it's filed and adverse comments start coming in, they start taking a harder look at your, 
at your regulations. So it's good to try to work those things out ahead of time if you can. Thank you, Ms. Shields. You're welcome. Ms. Sierra. Yes, um, thank you, um, Chair Urban, and thank you, Ms. Sledge, and all the presenters. First of all, this is very, very informative and helpful, so really appreciate it. Um, I had one um, question regarding also the stakeholder meetings. Um, you had talked about you know, the um, public stakeholder meetings that we can hold, and I believe you said you know, we could do them as part of a board meeting. Mm -hmm. um, under the Bagley Keen Act, um, or we also can hold them outside of a board meeting and then we would receive a transcript. Um, board members would have a transcript of that meeting. Um, I wanted to ask if we were to do um, the latter and have, a, it's not a board meeting, but it's a public meeting, can board members though participate like in a listening mode if it's held in that, um, in that way? Or do we just need to wait for a transcript? I think that um, you can attend, but if a majority of members are attending, then it's considered a meeting. Okay. So a majority of any board or committee is a meeting. So if you do, um, what happens typically is we'll ask you to let the, the, the executive director know if you want to go. And then if there is a majority of any committee, because it's not just committee, just the board, but a, a majority of any committee of the board also is a meeting. Okay. So if you had like a three person committee and two, two people of the committee showed up, there's a majority there. So my point is, if you start, if your executive director starts seeing that a lot of board members want to go, then I would set it as a notice meeting, okay. because then you don't have to worry about a violation of the Open Meeting Act. Um, because you're present together. It's just unavoidable that you're going to talk to each other. <laughs> just, you can't, there's just no way to control that. I mean, it's just human nature. We want to talk to each other. We work together. We have the same thing in common. It just, it happens. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just that you have to think about your time because I know that when, it, when we were doing drug compounding for pharmacy board and we had to rent out the Sa San Diego Convention Center, for the meeting and it went for three days from like 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. for three days that I think all of us thought we were gonna just disintegrate. And so it was really exhausting. And so from that point on, we decided to break it up into smaller committee meetings topically okay. and were able to manage it better that way and then hold informal stakeholder meetings that were run by staff. And so you'd have to figure out um, how large of an issue it is because if you if you're getting into the San, San Diego Convention Center numbers, yeah, um, the meetings are very very long, okay. so it just you'll have to. That's one of the things you're going to explore. Like I said, in that next steps agenda item, you're gonna your staff's going to need to do some some legwork and research okay. these items for you in advance. Prepare a white paper. Sometimes you'll even want to consult with a subject matter expert who will give you mm -hmm. some ideas of how to approach this consult with your legal counsel. I can't stress enough how important that your legal counsel needs to be involved in every step of the way and at these meetings. I go to all the regulation meetings for my clients. Um, and I go and, and, and I listen mainly because my role is not to be interjecting myself, but to, to respond to any issues that may come up and be prepared to address down the road with the, with the clients. So have your legal counsel involved, consulting with your executive director, preparing um, these issues for you to discuss at a board meeting. And then you all can decide how you want to move forward in implementing the concept. Because like I said, the concept phase is the most important part of any rulemaking. The rest of it kind of flows naturally from your policy decision. But making that policy call is the hardest part of regulations. So. Great. Thank you. It's very helpful. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Other comments or questions from board members? All right, thank you. Thank you very much to the team. I would now like to ask if there is any um, public comment from those in the audience. Ms. Hurtado, could you um, call on anyone who would like to comment? Okay, um, members of the public who wish to comment on any item may do so when prompted. For those connected through the internet, please take a moment to locate the raise hand icon on your screen. This will be used to signal that you wish to comment. As a reminder, um, 
to indicate that you'd like to comment, please uh, press the raise icon on your screen, raise hand icon. For those joining us by telephone, you may press star nine to indicate that you would like to comment. You will then be called and have up to three minutes to make your comment. If anyone wishes to comment, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're on the phone. Thank you, Ms. Hurtado. We'll wait for uh, a little bit to see if anyone, if people are thinking and would like to put together their comment. Yeah, at this time, no one has raised their hand. Thank you. All right, uh, seeing no requests for public comment at this time, I would simply like to extend thanks again to the team from the Department of Consumer Affairs for this wonderfully detailed and very informative pair of presentations for us. Um, I, I speak only for myself, um, but there probably will be nods um, when, I, when I say that we really very much appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you to the board members as well for engaging and asking questions. With that, um, thanks again to everyone um, from DCA. Apologies, thanks again to everyone from DCA. And we will now move to agenda item number three. The board uh, for agenda item three will go into a closed session for discussion of the executive director's appointment of the general counsel under authority of government code 11126A1. Before the board departs for the closed session discussion, is there any public comment on this item from the audience? Again, using the raise hand function or star nine if you're on a phone, anyone wishing to make a comment, please do so now. All right, thank you. Um, for members of the public, the board will depart to another session um, to undertake the closed session discussion. You are welcome to stay. This meeting will remain open and we will return when we have completed our discussion of the closed session item. Thank you very much. And board members, please join me um, in the closed session. <laughs>